Heathcote Williams, actor, playwright, magician, poet, recluse. Recluse? I mean, why? A talented actor, a successful playwright, he should be out there doing the chat shows, but he isn't. Instead, he lives in a little cottage in Cornwall, and when people ask themselves round for tea, he says things like, I'm sorry, but I've only got one cup, as I well know. So, the Heathcote Williams collection. Books, plays, films, they're all here. Well, at least I hope they are. It's been a real nightmare, I can tell you. Some of the stuff's pretty obscure. I'm still worried about a few of the dates. Now, of course, if the man just gave interviews, it would be so much easier. But less of a challenge. It all started five years ago, June 1988. The Philip K. Dick collection was almost complete. It all got a lot easier after he died. Anyway, subconsciously, I must have been looking for something else. I'd read somewhere that Jonathan Cape sold an epic poem about Wales to an American publisher for the record-breaking sum of $100,000, and I was intrigued, especially when I discovered that the author had no interest in money and didn't even have a bank account. I bought the book as soon as it came out, but it wasn't until a year later that I started to collect properly. Sacred Elephant. And what's the first thing you notice? Yep, same spines. Same spines, same typeface, same layout. A collector's dream, and I knew immediately that I had to have them all. 1990, Falling for a Dolphin. 1991, Auto again. And then, of course, there were the foreign editions. It plummets and rises again, circling you on the surface, fixing you with a look that seems calculated to incinerate all further resistance. It sidles down beneath your legs, parting them with its bottled nose, and slowly rises, deftly tuning itself to your center of gravity. As you find a handhold on its dorsal fin, its muscles tense, bends its backbone, levering its flukes up and down, and explodes into action, sculling and skimming across the water, rising and falling like a barrage balloon. Ten, fifteen, twenty knots, you gasp for breath as you're scooped in and out of the water, trying to kneel, slipping, a rickety human outrigger, drawn through a tornado of foam, shouting ecstatic, childish smatterings, swept along in a ferment of physicality, then buried in the water, then surfacing, and gasping and choking again as the wind knocks the air back down your lungs, and breathing seems as hard as drinking water from a fire hydrant. The Poet Laureate, Ted Hughes, said Whale Nation was brilliant, cunning, dramatic and wonderfully moving, a steady accumulation of grandeur and dreadfulness. But of course, Heathcote Williams does have his critics. As far as I'm concerned, the grandeur applies to the photographs and the dreadfulness to the text. I mean, I know it looks a bit like poetry, but um, there's the rhythm, meter, cadence, assonance. No, Heathcote Williams doesn't write poetry. Well, it's shopping lists. Or best, uh, captions for photographs. And how convenient that these uh, expensively produced books are turned out by the dozen, when membership of organisations like Greenpeace has never been higher. But the really interesting thing with the collector is this. Otto Geden was actually first published in 1982. Sacred Elephant in 1984, and Whale Nation in 1986. But the story really begins on Friday the 19th of December, 1959. Heathcote Williams, a 16-year-old Eton schoolboy, is staging an open-air exhibition of his paintings. With the air of a professional, he informed me, I ran a bit short of money, so I decided to sell some of my paintings. They cost around three or four guineas each. Can I interest you at all, sir? Heathcote Williams' first name was, in fact, originally part of his second. He was born John Heathcote Williams in 1941, the son of a QC. He soared one barrel off the family name after being thrown out of Eton in the late 50s, the opening volley in a long battle against polite society. After being asked to leave Eton, he lived in a Franciscan monastery for a while and then ended up at Oxford, where he studied law for two years but he's always maintained that his real education was gained at Hyde Park Corner. The time is now seven o'clock. The place is Hyde Park, Marble Arch, Speaker's Corner, Plum of England. 1964, the Speakers. 
Petticoat Williams' first publication, a documentary novel based on the lives of four Hyde Park speakers. In order to ensure the authenticity of the dialogue, Heathcote lived with the speakers for six months. Here you have an Irish communist attacking the Irish socialist. Here you have the Irish Republican army attacking the Connolly Association. And I'm here on my own today to attack all the bloody lot. I mean, I believe in nothing. With the speakers, Heathcote Williams was firmly established. And in 1965, he began work on a new piece for local Stigmatic. Stigmatic, an obscure play by an English recluse. A story of two thugs who beat up an actor because he's famous. A play that's obsessed a major Hollywood star for over 20 years. A play that was turned into a film personally financed by Al Pacino. The local Stigmatic has never been shown publicly until now. We've seen that bloody hand. Seen that bloody hands, favoured by having trapped three vacant. Won't make a difference. They were bloody vacants. You've seen that bastard dog. Isn't that him? That one? Who? Won't make a difference. They were fucking vacants. Who? What's the time? One of those people you found. There. No. See there? No, there. 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 There he is. You see there? The speakers had been critically applauded by a diverse range of people that included William Burroughs and Anthony Burgess, but perhaps most significantly by Harold Pinter. So, when the Travers Theatre wanted the other half of a double bill, Harold Pinter's new play, The Dwarfs, was teamed up with Stigmatic. After a brief run in London, Pinter passed the script on to an American director, David Wheeler. He gave it to a young actor, Al Pacino. It seems to be about a few things, and envy would be one of them about, uh, identity would be another, fame is a part of it too, I guess, uh, our relationship, people who are not famous, their relationship to people who are famous, haves and have nots, that kind of thing, I think he was sort of swimming in all that stuff at the time he wrote the play, I think he was also circling around this, and today I think it's a pretty hot theme, the theme of the local stigmatic. I think it's come, it's had a kind of uh, foreboding about it. spend my life, you know, ducking, and, you know, that's not, although you can avoid things, which I sort of try to do from time to time, but more or less I, I've had to um, adjust. Do you mind at all being recognized by strangers? Oh, no, 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 it's just part of your own, uh, well, they, uh, they usually get my name wrong. And uh, then they get embarrassed and walk away. No, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, doesn't take much out. You know, I we'll expect a lot of them must come up to you, ask you for your autograph, then say it's for their small son, their niece, someone you never heard of, just to cover up. Huh? Yes, Can I have you, your autograph? No, it's funny you should. Oh. It's all right. It reminds me of the, uh, you know, the Jacobean plays. It has that kind of sardonic, black sort of humor to it. And yet it has that. How would you assess his physical condition and stature? In a few words, right? Some guidance. Well, I'll say about six feet. Protein stand. Well covered. Fairly good working order, I should think. Said you were very approachable, then. Kick him in the stomach, get him on the ground, put your handkerchief in his mouth, kick him again, we see what follows. Thing in the world once you grasp it. Now you take life, for example. 
This girl he shacked up with, Sharon. She thinks he's you. And when Barry and Bear bed David, he thinks he's you, and she thinks she's being done by you. Well, it's not quite as simple as it Keep it, keep it, keep it. The problem with staging it and it happening live is that the the immensity of the of the act sort of uh, um, uh, overshadows the, the the words that are being said during this ritualistic beating. And I thought with a movie that that we could avoid that by by abstracting the beating somewhat so that the words could be more palatable. Well, the play is indeed extremely violent, but I think it's also um, a play of nausea, one's own um, romanticism too, and, uh, and vulnerability and weakness in being allow in allowing oneself to be sucked in by by film stars and heroes and politicians. Well, it's got nothing to do with resenting you, nothing at all. It's just that it seems stupid. You're not there with Sharon and Ray to defend yourself. I think he's ready now, Ray. Have his face done. When I finally got the opportunity to meet Hathcote, it had been like, um, you know, we had corresponded and I admired his work so much. Not just this play, other things he's done, ACDC and a few of his other plays, and his books, his poetry. So then seeing him was, uh, was really a, a, a kind of a thrill for me. And uh, then I met him, showed him the picture, and after the film, he was sitting there. <laughs> he said, uh, he thought it was, uh, he thought that he had written this play three people ago. All his work is deeply political, I think. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, informed not only by violent um, contempt, actually, um, for the way people are manipulated and for the, the status quo, the complacency um, of the status quo. Um, but also by uh, now, certainly more and more evidently in his later work, the work on whales and elephants and so on and the automobile, um, compassion for the, for the weak. Well, I find him amusing and, and interesting and uh, I, I think he's brilliant. And, and, and he's the kind of guy you like to just, the kind of person you like to be around and just hear him talk about things. His read on things interests me. Kind of anarchic and uh, funny guy. The trouble about fame is that um, when you're tarnished with it, it remains, it sticks on you, and you can't get rid of the damn thing. In other words, Hercule Williams has a certain fame, whether he wishes it or not. Hethcote's next play was performed at the Royal Court, and it was very much a piece of its time. Light stigmatic, it attacked the culture of fame, but this time he used the language of madness and psychedelia to ridicule the mass media. The climax of the play involved a grisly trepanning sequence that was performed live on stage. It would give you a sensation in the brain, curiously, uh, uh, trotting through all this. For example, some of the, the, the guy Morris uses words, has con he knows the right words for everything. Like, for example, dimethoxyphenylethylamide. Yeah, I took all morning to learn that word. Dimethoxyphenylethylamide, the trace element found in the urine of every schizophrenic. To actually get this stuff into, in, into your mind, I mean, you, you've literally become someone else, you know, because you're... I mean, for the time that you're doing it, you seem to be equipped with uh, far more knowledge than's healthy to own. Some people have, have, have called it ahead of its time. But I don't think it's time ever came. It was very difficult because we didn't understand it. We had to rehearse with a dictionary. In fact, with a huge, big, fat dictionary. And a lot of it we didn't understand. You'd find quite odd if you, if you read the play now because, well, there was a phrase that at one point male chauvinist pig, and this is 1970, none of us had heard such a thing before. We didn't know what a chauvinist was or how it could possibly apply in the sort of gender context, and we had to kind of work that out for ourselves. 